Today's sermon is what to do when God invites you over for dinner. I can just skip to the end and say, uh, go. <laughs> there you, well, you don't want, oh, you leave to go there, maybe. <laughs> I think saying thank you is appropriate. You guys remember that scene from the Fellowship of the Ring at the Council of Elrond, and there's these dwarves and elves and, and men and, and hobbits there, and, and uh, they're trying to talk about how to get rid of that one dangerous magic ring, remember that? And they got to take it to this fiery mountain and toss it into the volcano, and, and that, but that place is ruled by all the bad guys, by Sauron and all his, his monsters and everything, and and one of the men there, he's a big Viking kind of guy, and he's a great warrior. And, and as they're talking about going into the land of Mordor, this evil country to get rid of the ring, he, he goes like this. He says, one does not simply walk into Mordor. He goes on to say that getting to the enemy's land could not be done even with 10,000 soldiers. And, you know, we all know that great things take great effort to get a great reward takes a lot of work. You just can't walk into Mordor. But that's exactly how we get into heaven, through the front door. What do you do when God invites you over to dinner? I want you to imagine for a second. God of the universe. By the way, there's more neurons in your brain than there are stars in the universe. So God's great up there. He's great in what he's done in here too. This, this mighty, mighty God would look at this little, little piece of dust spinning around in this gigantic universe and he would actually care what happens on it. Not only, the Bible says he, he knows when a, when, a, when a sparrow falls. God is bigger than Thor. We're, we're talking a big deal. God of the universe knows how many hairs are on your head before and after you shampoo. God of the universe condescending to come down, to put on flesh, to set aside his glory, to become like us, to die on the cross for us. And then this God says, I want to walk with you in the cool of the day. Is God says, that's in Genesis. Then in Revelation, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Let me in. We'll dine together. We'll do life together. We'll walk. Everything together. God says, I want to be your friend. You say, well, I can't. I'm a sinner. Well, that's what they accused Jesus of being, was a friend of sinners. God of the universe cares about you. He cares about and people say, oh, I don't need God hanging over my shoulder caring about every word I say. Yeah, he cares. He's like a parent. Every thought in my head, yeah, he cares. Because he says, boy, Dan, i got so much better for you than that. Everything, God cares. And he says, I want to do life with you. Let me in. Let's sit down. Or, or come on over, I'm cooking steaks. What do you do? You say yes. You open up. You go. Let's read uh, Matthew chapter 22, 1 through 14. Brother Dwayne was pointing out in church that this is the, this is the word of God right here. And when we read it, uh, in Sunday school class, he's pointing out, when we read this, we need to pay attention. We need to respect this. This is the word of God. Let's, uh, let's keep our minds alert and let's pay attention to what's going on here. So Matthew chapter 22. Jesus is talking to these Pharisees and Herodians and the, and the uh, Sadducees, all these people there in the temple. And Jesus spoke to them again in parables saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. So the kingdom of heaven... It's like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. In this story, the king is God the Father, the son is God the Son, okay? This is Jesus. 
So he's talking about himself. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. So he sent his servants. His servants are, in this instance, it's not going to be spiritual heavenly angels, but it's going to be you and I. It's going to be pastors and missionaries and Christians and one Christian talking to his neighbor and just going out trying to bring your family and your husband, your wife, your children. It's bringing people to what God is, is doing, bringing people to Jesus. It says there, uh, he sent them out to invite those who had been, uh, to tell them that the banquet was ready. In, in ancient Middle East culture, and also it's very interesting because a lot of these have parallels with what happened in ancient Greece too, even though Greece and the Middle East had very different cultures. But uh, you'd send out an invitation ahead of time, invite a lot of people. And then you'd send out another invitation uh, through your servants or in person, knock on the door, say, okay, the banquet's ready, you can come now. Everything's ready, everything's been prepared. So you have this invitation, then you have a second invitation that goes out. Then he sent some more servants and said, tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner my oxen and my fatted cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. So see, I wasn't too far off when I said, God's inviting you over for steaks. So everything is ready for the wedding banquet. The son is going to get married. Uh, the bride is the church, right? The bride is the church of God. So God is saying, everybody come, everybody come. Jesus is, is marrying the church. Verse 5. But they paid no attention and went off. They ignored him. Where'd some people go? Some went to their field. Another went to his business. They seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. So some ignored. Some went to work. And some of them were very, very hostile to the message. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And yes, that's supposed to be scary. And no, I'm not God's PR man, and I'm not going to make that soft and cute and sweet. If we reject God's call, there is damnation. There is wrath. There is punishment. This story is not a cute story. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. You notice what made them undeserving? The fact that they didn't answer the invitation. That was, that was the only thing that made them undeserving. He didn't point out anything about their character, about their past faults, anything. He gave the invitation, come and take part in the banquet, the wedding ceremony, the party. And they didn't. Some just ignored it. Some were busy with work. And some were very abusive and violent. And God says, they're unworthy. I invited them, but they're unworthy. Go to the street corners and invite the, to the banquet everyone you find. Brothers and sisters, this is his, the king's mandate on his servants. This is what God is asking from you and I, okay? Go out to the street corner, in the marketplace, at work, everywhere you go. And just invite everybody you can to come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus. He says, go to the street corner and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So are we supposed to say, well, I don't think that person would be a good Christian. Uh, they would never become a Christian. We've got people in this room that people said would never become a Christian. Every church does. Go, don't decide. You're not God. Don't decide who's worthy. We go out there and share the message. Amen? Amen. So the servants went out to the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. See that? And the wedding hall was filled with guests, and that's the way it should be. That's beautiful. Go out there, grab the bad as well as the good. You don't just give this invitation. There is a God. God loves you. He's throwing a party. Why don't you come? But when the king came to see the guests, he noticed a man there who is not wearing wedding clothes. Now, this is true in, in Greece, in ancient Greece, and the ancient Middle East. It, the, the kings, the rich guys, when they'd have a party, oftentimes this feast would last, last a few days. And uh, by the way, the Bible warned against 
drunkenness and gluttony at those feasts. So feasts were a big deal. Everybody loved them, but you still had to behave yourself. Uh, and what the rich guys would do when you came to the feast, you know what they'd do? They'd actually put a cloak on you, put a covering on you. In, in Greece, they talk about a rich guy have a lot of clothes. So you throw a big party, you got to have a lot of clothes. You come, you get the clothes put on you, that means you're supposed to be there. That, that's like a, a symbol of you also accepting, accepting grace, goodness from your host and being a part of, uh, of his party. You're not just an outsider. You're not just trying to bust the party. But there's a guy here who is offered the free meal, the free party, the free clothes... And incidentally, the Bible tells us as Christians that we're covered, we put on, we clothe ourselves in Jesus Christ. So our clothes are Jesus himself. So when God looks down, he doesn't see Dan Wolf stand there in all his sin. He sees the goodness of Jesus Christ. Isn't that interesting? God actually sees the goodness of Jesus Christ covering you. So he doesn't hold your sin against you anymore because he sees God's goodness. Isn't that cool? But there's a guy here at the party who's not wearing the clothes from, from, the, from God, from the king. He's just standing there by himself. And God goes to him gently. He says, companion or friend, how did you get here without wedding clothes? And at that point, the man should have said, I'm so sorry, I'm wrong, I've been doing things the wrong way. I want to have one of those clothes. I want to have one of those jackets. But no, the man was speechless. He didn't know what to say. God says, how come you're not doing things the way you're supposed to? I, 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 you, he doesn't have anything to say. Then the king told the attendants. Now listen, please listen, because this is not cute, warm, fuzzy. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are invited, but few are chosen. You can imagine a party at nighttime. There's lamps everywhere. It's bright. It's warm with all the people inside the tent, the pavilion. You get cut, tossed out into the night. It's cold. It's extra dark because that person was in the light. They, they saw things that a person living in darkness wouldn't have seen. But now they're out in the darkness. They were with God's people. They were with, they were somebody who was sitting in the church maybe year after year after year, and they never put on the clothes of Jesus Christ. They were there for the show. They were there for whatever. And they never were covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. They never said, Lord, cover me. I'm inadequate on my own. They never asked God to forgive them. They're there going through all the things church people go through, maybe trying to polish up their lives on, you know, trying to look good. I don't swear, whatever, you know. But they had never taken on the blood of Jesus Christ. They never confessed their sins. They never came through the door saying, I'm a sinner and I need salvation. I need, I need somebody to forgive me. I need grace. They were there on, all by themselves, pretty content to be there, pretty happy. And God says, you're not part of the wedding party. He tied him up and kicked him out. And this is symbolic of what? Hell. Hell. Yeah, yeah the, the wedding party is heaven. The kicking out of the darkness is, is hell. Brothers and sisters, I've heard pastors who say they don't want to talk about hell because it turns people off. Why am I supposed to edit Jesus Christ? Can anybody tell me that? If he's God in flesh who came down to die for our sins, why would we think to, to edit him? Jesus, no, no, don't talk. He's cute. Don't talk about hell. People don't like that. People don't, don't talk about people having to accept that invitation and decide to, to, to prioritize God. No, I could ignore it. No, could go to my business. No, whatever. I'm going to go. I'm going to accept that invitation. There's four ways, brothers and sisters, that you can seriously mess up. <coughs> We've all done things that you mess up. Sometimes you get caught. Sometimes you're embarrassed. There are, there are serious ways you can mess up for so that eternity is ruined for you. I don't think there are words, a phrase I can come up with in the English language or, or Japanese or any language that could convey how serious this is. You can mess up eternity. Today I'm going to give everybody here, listen, please, 
Today we're going to pray at the end of the service, and everybody here is going to have an opportunity to say, Lord God, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Lord God, I want to be at that wedding banquet. I know I've messed up. I need the grace that Jesus Christ bought on the cross with his own blood. Thank you, God, that your Bible says that you love me. Thank you, God, that your Bible says you'll forgive me if I come to you, and I'm coming, God. We're going to give everybody a chance to do that today, and everybody who's listening on the Internet or watching on television, okay? Everybody's going to have a chance to do that because if you miss this and you ruin eternity, the moment, the moment you step into that darkness where there's weeping and regret and gnashing of teeth, you're going to remember I was this close to the light. I was this close to the light, and I walked away. I want everybody in this room and everybody who hears this to be in heaven. Why not? We're going to love each other. We're going to love God. There's no excuse, no reason. If God invites you to dinner, you say yes. The front door is there. It's been opened by Jesus himself. And the only thing will keep you out of heaven. There's no locks on heaven's door. But sometimes there's a lock in our heart or in our mind. There's, there's four ways you can seriously mess up. One is spiritual laziness. Maybe you've never rejected God outright. Yeah, I believe in God. Sure, yeah. What about Jesus? Yeah, wasn't he that guy that died for our sins or something? You believe Jesus? Yeah. I want to go to heaven, yeah. I really don't care about that Bible stuff. Don't really care about what's going on at church. Don't really care about what God's doing. Uh, really don't want God to tell me what to do. No. But yeah, I believe it. Spiritually lazy, not rejecting God outright. You just ignore it. And it's possible, what, to, to, in your heart to know, boy, i got to get right with God. But what happens? One week, two weeks, not at church, a month, two months, a year, two years, it becomes 10 years, it becomes 20 years, it becomes, and you really don't care. Do you believe in God? Yeah. Of course, the devil believes in God. The Bible says demons believe in God and they shudder. They tremble. They're smarter than we are. We believe in God and yawn. <laughs> Say we believe in God. Do you love God? Have you fallen in love with God's goodness, God's beauty? Everything about God is wonderful. I don't see any hope here. I don't see any hope in the world, but I see hope in my Savior. Have you, oh, that cross is so dear to me because he took my messed up nastiness and died for it on there. And then he said, Dan, I'm going to take you as you are. And I say, okay, I'm coming because I don't see any hope anywhere else. And I... And God is pathetic and weak as my love is. I want to give everything to you. I'm going to give you everything in my heart to you. I want to live every day for you, Lord. My next breath is yours, Father. I want to live for you today. When we're too comfortable with our lives as they are and running our own lives the way we want, you know, we think, boy, I don't know if I become a Christian, maybe God's going to interfere with my life, and that would be correct. God does care how we live because he cares about us. Another way that we can miss out is because of good things like farming and, and work. We're too busy with work, our industry, sales, whatever it is. Yeah, I believe in God, yeah, but work is the center of my life. My life orbits work. Everything about me is oriented towards paying the bills, getting more money in the bank, whatever. Is work wrong? No, work is right. The Bible condemns laziness. Get out there, get a job. But what is your life orbit? You know, here's the sun. The earth orbits the sun, right? The, or the sun is the center of everything. Our lives, we need to orbit Jesus Christ. We need to orbit God. God needs to inform our choices, our opinions, our, our worldview, everything around God. The third reason that people ruin eternity for themselves is downright hostility towards God. They're angry to be invited to heaven. Angry 
to be invited to the party. They don't want to be with God, and they don't want to be at his party. I've had, I've had atheists tell me that... Uh, I've had atheists tell me that God, is, uh, God would be horrible to send anybody to hell. And I said, so you're telling me that if you knew that God was real and that he, he loved you and died for you on the cross, that boy, you'd want to be with him for eternity more than anything else? And they always say, well, no, I don't want to be with him. If, well, yeah, well, then God's giving you what you want. People ruin eternity for themselves because the door to the party is right there, the light's shining out, and they say, I'd rather be in the dark because if I get too close to God, I start to see that I'm not all. I get too close to God, I start to see some dirt on my hands. So they turn and walk away from the light of the party. Deep down inside, they know a spiritual truth. There's only room for one God. There is only room for one God, and they know it. And they've decided they're the best candidate for the job. I don't get that. I look at my life, and I think, no, no, no. What a horror if I was to sit on that throne. I can't even keep my life straight. How am I going to keep everybody else's life straight? I can't even keep my thoughts where they're supposed to be all the time. And I look at God and I say, yeah, that's the one I'm going to follow. I'm going to follow that guy because he's good and he loves me and he proved it by suffering on the cross for me. He rose again. Yeah, he's got the credentials. That's where I'm going to go. And people who look at themselves and say, I don't need to repent for anything, Nobody's going to tell me I have to say sorry for anything. Such people, unsurprisingly, do not end up in heaven in a relationship of mutual love, affection, and adoration with God. You've got to want to love God before you start to love God. The fourth way to mess up and miss out on heaven is spend your life in church but never putting on the banquet clothes. And there's many different people who could fit in this category. People who are cultural Christians without personal conviction. Are you a Christian? I'm born in the United States of America. So that means you've confessed your sin and given your heart to Jesus Christ? Religion was good enough for mom and dad. Religion is good enough for me. So that means you love God, love his ways, and deny yourself? That you see the wickedness in your own heart? I like religion because it helps me look down at other people. Spend your life in church, and all it is is cultural Christianity. Grandma and grandpa, great grandma, great grandma, mom and dad, my brothers and sisters all go to church, so I do. That does not make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. Going to church does not make you a Christian. How about people who enjoy the pomp and ceremony of church but don't believe? I don't get that. I'm actually, in my heart, a very irreligious person. I don't like ceremony. I don't like ritual. I, I, I would rather do almost anything, especially watch Doctor Who, than be at church if it's not real. I'm not into that stuff. But some people, they like the pomp, they like the ceremony, they like the, the long robes or whatever, the incense, whatever, the crosses, whatever, sitting in the pews, the standing up, the sitting down. They like it. There's nothing wrong with any of that stuff, but if that's why you're in church, God of the universe may one day say to you, why aren't you wearing the wedding clothes? and you mess up eternity. Don't mess up eternity. There's not words. I don't have words to talk about what God is trying to communicate here. 
People who use religion to feel self-righteous but never humble themselves before God, using religion as a tool. <coughs> How about people who go to church out of habit? <coughs> okay, it's Sunday. Get up, go, write that check. Sing a couple songs, put it in the offering plate, get in my car, go out for lunch. Next week, repeat. But never a real relationship with God. People who go to church but try to dictate terms to God. How about that? Okay, God, I'm here if you do boom, 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 boom for me. God, I'm here if you do what I want you to do. God, I'm here, and I'm going to tell you what it's all about. That guy was at the wedding banquet, and he was not part of God's agenda. He did not put on the wedding clothes because he was pretty comfortable telling the, well, till he met the king straight up, right? Then he didn't have anything to say. People who go for the music or the preaching or the pretty girls or whatever. Go to show off their new suit. Remember that was... Remember uh, King Herod liked to hear John the Baptist talk, but he never believed. Or people who sense the reality of true faith. They say, there's something real going on at church. There's something there. And so they go and they listen. And week after week after week. And they kind of, instead of jumping in the pool, they kind of enjoy dipping their little toe in the pool. They never commit. They say, boy, those are good coats. Those are good coats. I can see that. Putting on that coat has made a difference in your life. But, oh, yeah, nice material. They never put on their coat. Messing up their own eternal future. What does it matter if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? doesn't matter a thing. These are just a few of the ways that keep you could miss out on the party that God is throwing, and it is a shame. And if you can think of a, a stronger word than that, you can put it there. It's a shame. Because what God is offering to us, brothers and sisters, it's wonderful. It is free, and it's right before us. Jesus Christ opened the doors with his death on the cross. All we have to do is accept the invitation. He's inviting us to dinner. The appropriate, the only reasonable thing to do is say, yes, God, I see myself, and I know I need a Savior I'm not going to pretend anymore. I'm not going to fight with you anymore, God. I'm not going to make excuses anymore, God. Please forgive me. I want to be part of everything you are, Lord God. Right now, we're going to bow our heads. Everybody here, if you're unsure if you've ever done this, you can do it right now. If you're listening, if you're watching, you can do this right now. Let's get right with the Lord and then see what it means to be a person wearing this coat for the rest of our lives. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, here I am. Lord, we confess, we admit that there's a whole lot of darkness and nastiness and bitterness and, and, and selfishness and self-righteousness and hard-headedness. Lord, this is, when we're honest with ourselves, this is what we see. And Lord, when we look at you, we see goodness. And Lord, your Bible said that you will forgive us if we come to you in faith. Your Son, Jesus Christ, came down to earth, and we beat him, we spit on him, we nailed him to a cross, and he did this so that he could give his perfect life as a substitute to cover all of our sins, to pay the penalty of all of our sins, Lord. And on the cross, he bled and took our punishment upon himself, Lord. And Father, right now, I'm standing before you, and I want to say thank you, Jesus, for dying for my sin. I don't deserve this, Lord. God, you're good. You're so good. And then Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and God gave us a promise that everyone who would come to him in faith, that we too will rise from the dead, and we will be given eternal life and not eternal death and darkness and regret. Lord God, I'm here today. Please forgive me. Give me that wedding banquet coat, Lord. Lord, cover me with Jesus. Lord, I want heaven. I want goodness. I want love. I want forgiveness. I want everything that you're about, Lord God. Lord God, I set aside myself. I don't want to be the king of my universe anymore because I was a bad king. Lord God, I trust you. 
I want my life to orbit you, Lord. I want to be all about you, Lord. Please, Father, help me to give my life to you today. And Lord, help me to commit my life to you, to live for you every single day, every single breath of my life. God, you're good. Thank you so much for hearing this prayer. I trust you. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.